okay. Here we are where we left off last time. Except, oh yeah, thanks for doing that. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I think it's always too low. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to repeat a few things because there are some things here that are difficult, seem, seem to be uh, difficult. I mean, I get a bunch, usually after a lecture or someone looks at the uh, videos, well, not videos, we don't have videos, listens to the audio, they uh, send me an email. And I get three or four emails about the same thing. So I'm just going to repeat a little bit of what, what's going on. What's coming in is signal plus noise. And we're assuming a linear system, not only for the channel in terms of the additive noise, but also for the front end of this receiver. So that we can write the input as in the simplest case, signal plus noise, um, where this is one of many signals for a given key second period of time. And in that key second period of time, if it's a simple binary case, we're going to transmit one of two choices for the signal. One represents a zero and one represents a binary one. Um, and in any event, no matter what we transmit, noise will be added. And of course, this is the analog version of what's going on. Um, in the case that the channel might distort the signal or filter it, then the modified signal looks like this. I haven't said very much about this model. If you remember, this was the effect of inter-symbol interference. You transmit a pulse of a certain shape uh, and a certain width, t seconds. And this has an effect of changing the shape and probably uh, elongating the pulse. So you keep transmitting at the same rate, but one pulse will smear over into another pulse's region of time, and so on. But you know, I haven't really said too much about this, so we're looking really just at the additive model. Um, after, so in that case, we really don't need an equalizer. We'll have a front end filter. This filter may be of a special type. Now, I haven't talked about that either, but we'll have a front end filter. For the moment, the only thing that this filter does really is it limits the noise bandwidth. It's a filter that's designed to um, receive the signal in terms of its frequency content. And anything outside that, it filters out. So it limits the noise bandwidth to the signal bandwidth. Um, we may not be using this right now, and we sample. Now, when we sample, you know, strictly speaking, this really should be like little n times t, the nth instant of time, you know, every t seconds. Okay, so, but this is like for an instant of time, at each instant of time. We take a sample, it's the sample of a signal amplitude and a noise voltage. And if you remember, you know, of course, the signals are deterministic, we choose them. Uh, the amplitudes at the sampling instant are deterministic, at least in this model. You know, in reality, things are a little bit more complicated. The noise is a random variable. So it's a, it's a random process, which at an instant of time, like the sampling instant, is a random variable. So it can take a lot of values according to certain probabilities. Um, because of the randomness in the noise, this is random. The voltage is random. So the voltage is, you know, we look at the voltage, but behind that, it's the sum of a deterministic voltage plus a random voltage. Okay, so, and this is really just a simplification of notation. Um, and of course, the problem of detection is to look at this voltage and determine which of the eyes is true. That's basically the problem. You know, in a binary case, we may have only two. In a general communication system, we may have M. M may be very large. You know, and they're all in the presence of noise. So we look at Z, and we try to determine which A sub I, or which I. Because once we know that, then we know, is it a zero, is it a one? All right, so we really need to we're trying to determine something about this in the presence of noise. 
And noise has the effect, positive and negative, of changing the voltage we observe from the A sub I. Okay, so that kind of summarizes this. Now, one thing I wanted to say. Our model is the noise at any instant is got a mean of zero. So if the Gaussian density function is centered at zero, it has a certain variance. Okay, so it's zero mean Gaussian random variable. And the zero mean doesn't change, no matter what time we sample, and the variance remains always the same. So in the presence of that kind of noise, we need to try to determine with accuracy which A sub I was transmitted. And we do this every T seconds. So for any T seconds, we have some alternatives. If it's a binary system. It's either I equals 1 or 2. A sub 1, A sub 2. If it's M airy, like we call it, M airy, then it's A sub 1, A sub 2, up to A sub M. And you have more alternatives to try to differentiate in the presence of noise. Um, OK, so do I want to say any more about this? I think it should be, should be pretty clear. OK, so the density function of the noise, Gaussian, right? Mean of 0, you know, remember the general form of a Gaussian density or Gaussian random variable. You know, generally speaking, it's going to be n0 minus the mean value right up here in the numerator and within the square. So if you don't see it there, then the mean is 0. The variance is sigma 0 squared. So that's our model. So what's going on here, this is the probability of the voltage at a sampling instant given that S1 of T was transmitted. So given that at the sampling instant, the voltage for the transmission of S1 of T is A1. So that's why you see the A1 here or the A2 here. So we go back for a minute, because this is really what most of the questions were about. This is a value, A1 or A2. This is the random noise, and this is random because of that. This is Gaussian. Because this is Gaussian, random variable, this is a Gaussian random variable. What's changed? Well, the mean value has changed. Right? Because if I take the expected value of Z, it's equal to the expected value of A sub I, which is A sub I. So we have to think about that, right? Expected value means whatever you're taking the expected value of, you stick it into the integral, you multiply it times the density function, and you integrate. So I have A sub I times the Gaussian density function integrated. But the A sub I comes outside the integral. And every density function, Gaussian or not, when you integrate it over all its range, it's always 1. So you're left with the A sub I. So I'm not just, you know, like saying it. It's just, if you work it out as an expected value, that's what it is. The expected value of this, by the assumption we made, is 0. So the expected value of this, given A1, or given S1, whatever you want, whichever way, is A1. The expected value of this, given S2, or A2, is A2. Now the variance. I'm going to say it a different way than I did last time. If I take a random variable, and I add any deterministic number, quantity, whatever, to it, the variance remains the same. OK, so I'm taking a random variable with a certain variance. I'm adding a non-random quantity to it, and the variance of this is the same as the variance of this. Now, you can work that out, too, because variance has its definition. It's the expected value. If I want the variance of this, it will be the expected value of z minus its mean value, quantity squared. Whole thing expected value. So what I have is z minus its mean value, which could be a, which is a sub i i equals 1, 2, squared, 
times the density function integrated over the range. And if you work that out, the expected value of z becomes sigma zero squared, same as n zero. So that's why you see I'm able to do this. I'm saying, what I'm saying here is, what's the density function of z given s1 or a1? And you look over here, and what I'm saying is the density function of z, it's like a conditional density function, is Gaussian. Given s1 means s1 is true, you know, given that s1 is the transmitted signal, so the mean value is a1. And the variance stays the same as the noise. So Gaussian with a mean of a1 and a variance of sigma 0 squared. S2, same story, except the mean changes. Now remember what I said before. At any instance of time, it's one or the other. But when we look at the performance of the system, we look at all these, these two alternatives together. So when I draw a plot like this, let me just get rid of this. Okay. When I draw a plot like this, I'm drawing a plot that's relevant to the transmission, transmission of a zero and the transmission of a one. So here is, here is the Gaussian density up here, sketched, peaking at A2, that's this one, and we call them the likelihood. So likelihood of, of um, S2, likelihood of S1. And here's the other one, peaking at A1. This is for S1 of T. They both have the same variance, right? Both have the same width. And they'll cross, actually, in the middle, which is like A1 plus A2 over 2. Right? They'll cross in the middle. Um, and what's, so what's going on here? Well, I went ahead and I said, we'll use this to set a threshold, to decide. Every time we take a sample of a voltage, Z, we're going to test it against the threshold. If it's bigger than the threshold, we're going to say, in this case, A1. Right? Let the threshold be right here. If it's less, we'll say A2. We make a hard decision. We don't say maybe A1, maybe A2. We say A1, A2. And those, that A1, A2, depend, you know, that now maps to like binary 0, binary 1, however you wanted to do it. So as you can see, huh, the probability of that voltage given A1 is very large in this region. Like if I integrate from, you know, around the mean value like one standard deviation, sigma zero on either side, I 67 or 70 percent, something like that. So it's very, very large. So this really is the, what we call the most likely value, the mean value. Uh, but noise changes, changes the story. And the problems arise because we can transmit um, S2 of T, but get voltage values or there is a non-zero probability of getting voltage values, is the way I should say it, above the threshold. And remember, our rule is, the voltage above the threshold, we say S1 of T. So we've made an error, because it's possible that S2 of T was transmitted, and the noise significantly added in a positive way, such that I exceed the threshold, and I say S1 when it really was S2. Same thing on the other side. Voltage can add and dra drag me down. So, you know, when I drag me down so that I say S1 when it really is, um, what is it now? When I, it's really, I say S2 when it's really S1. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta look at these things a little bit so you don't get confused. But this is one type of error, and this is the other. Right? It's kind of the error that we fall below the threshold when we expect to be above the threshold, you know, based on our rule. And we're above the threshold when we expect it to be below the threshold, based on our rule. Okay. Now, system model, this is kind of where we left off. The system source of the transmitter is a set. We were really simplifying it to binary. Receive signal is something like this. 
N of T is, uh, is really a Gaussian random process at an instant of time, sampling instant. We model the random variable as additive weight Gaussian noise. Okay, additive, uh, additive gets additive. White means the variance is always the same, and the mean is zero. Gaussian is the model for the density function. It's Gaussian. Uh, so the waveform is reduced to a single number z, right there, where t is the duration. And we normally wrote this as z equals a sub i plus n zero. Um, the receiver has to make a decision. Now notice things are turned around now. And we're going to use Bayes' law. Okay, basically, the Bayes' law, first off, uses conditional densities or conditional probabilities. And it allows us to look at them like probability of A given B and relate it to probability of B given A. So this is the probability of transmitting, of ha of transmitting S1 given the voltage Z we measure. And we say, well, if that probability is larger than this probability, H1, which really means S1. And if it's less, H2, which really means S2. S2 is bigger than S1 in terms of probability. So this is like, what is the chance that we transmitted S1 given this voltage? And if this probability or chance is greater then the probability we, tra we transmitted S2, given that voltage, we say S1, right? So it's a problem involving a random variable, and the only way we can solve it in some optimal way is to use probabilities, use probability first. There's no other way that we can do it. These are the, called the a posteriori probability. Z given S1, Z given S2 were the likelihoods. These are a posteriori. Right? This is like after the fact. Remember? We have our a priori probability, P of S1, P of S2. Probability of transmitting S1s and probability of transmitting S2. They go across the channel. Noise gets added. At the other end, we ask, what was the, what was the probability of transmitting S1 given this voltage we measured? So it's like after. After we've gone through the channel, gone through the receiver, made our sample, looked at the voltage called a posteriori. Okay, so remember this, Bayes' law. That's all this is. Bayes' law or Bayes' rule. Oh, man. <laughs> How many times are you going to join this session? Okay. <laughs> Bayes' law, stay in there. Okay, Bayes' law, Bayes' rule. Now, when I wrote it before, remember, I said P of A given B equals P of B or A comma B, the joint probability, divided by the probability of the uh, condition, P of B. And that, you know, if you take this and put it under here, that's the P of B. And this is really just the joint probability written using Bayes', Bayes law. Right? So remember, you can write Bayes' law. And actually, the way you get this is you say, well, you write it. P of A given B equals P of A comma B divided by P of B. And then you realize P of A comma B is the same as P of B comma A. <clears throat> that allows you to write the other side differently and then set them equal. And that's what you get. So this test that was on the other page is really equivalent to this test. You know, think about Bayes' rule. It's equivalent to that. Get rid of any common quantities that don't affect the test on either side. So it's equivalent to the probability of a voltage given S1 times the probability with which S1 occurs, greater than or less than. The same thing for S2, which is the same as this. You know, probabilities, we're assuming probabilities are always, always positive, so nothing blows up here. And they're never negative, so the inequalities don't change uh, sense. So we could form this ratio and compare it, simply compare it. Is it bigger or less than a simple ratio of probability? If the probability of transmitting S2s 
is a half, for example, and the probability of transmitting S1 then has to be a half, then this is just one. It's a value. And how do we get this value? Well, you have to know a little something about the information source that you're transmitting. Is it speech? Is it music? Is it data? Okay, and we don't find that there's a, you know, if you're a little off, that's fine. Because what we usually do in practice is we always make small adjustments to these things. So that's the test, though. Um, this all arises from this, these probabilities, which are eight posteriori probabilities. So we call this, if we give it a very fancy kind of name, it's the maximum a posteriori method or minimum error criteria. And many times we just say map, like your book does, map. Okay. Left-hand ratio. Remember this, huh? These we call likelihoods. So reasonably so, this is called a likelihood ratio. <laughs> it's a ratio of the likelihood. So if we go back a little bit, we say, well, how are we going to, how are we going to ever perform this test? Okay, well, let's go back. These are the likelihoods. We just go back a little bit. We assume the noise was Gaussian. That gave us this. And that comes from the Gaussian assumption for the noise. And that likelihood ratio test is just the ratio of this function over this function. Now, that gives you a big mess. Okay, but a lot of things cancel. That stuff cancels. You're left with exponential over exponential. And we'll deal with that easily. The whole idea, though, is once you have the likelihood ratio compared to some number, the ratio of those probabilities, P of S2, P of S1, or P of S1 over P of S2. Once you have that, all this, you keep simplifying, simplifying, until you get on the left-hand side, Z. Z compared to, is it bigger or less than a whole bunch of stuff that turns out to be a number? All right, and so that is your threshold. You're going to test a voltage Z against that number, whatever it is. And it's really not as, it's not as hard as it looks. So you start with your likelihood. You form the test we had right here. You say, okay, that's going to be the way in which I'm going to make my decision. I'm going to compare the probability of one alternative to another given my voltage. And then you use Bayes law until you get to here. Now you have a very nice test. It's called the likelihood ratio test. And it compares the likelihood ratio to a number. But we need to simplify it. There's an important role played by Bayes' law. You know, Bayes' law because you've got an experiment in which you know something a priori. And then you have an unknown channel. And then you measure something a posteriori. So Bayes' law relates what you're looking at to what happened, or it relates everything back to the transmission. So Bayes' law is very critical in getting a link between transmitter and receiver that involves the probabilistic channel. Okay, so Gaussian noise was the uh, assumption was this, but we don't really need that any longer. Here, is, here are the likelihoods. Here is the ratio of the likelihoods. So we just plug them in and work with them, and we end up with this. This is one way of, of writing things. Okay, so, and don't forget that this, um, this was the test. This ratio, greater than or less than a ratio of probabilities, a number. So what happened here? <laughs> if they're equally likely, a half, a half, this is one. So we'll have this 
compared to one. But how did we get this? The natural logarithm. It's a monotonic function, it gets rid of the exponential, and it doesn't affect the decision making because it's monotonic. Right? So you take the natural log of both sides, and of course the natural log of one is zero. Okay, so I mean the log to any base of one is zero. So you get um, you get zero here. So be very careful. I took the natural logarithm to get to this. I assumed, actually, I assumed equally likely, so this is one. And then I took the natural log of both sides to get to this. So we're not quite there yet, because remember what I said, all we have is z. That's it. So we need to now fix this up carefully, because we don't really want to change this. I mean, we may have to, but you know, in this case, we don't have to change the sense of the inequalities. But always remember, you know, if you're going to multiply by minus or something, you, they may change around. But in this case, that doesn't happen. So we can simplify this, and we get this. Okay, so, for example, going back, a1 plus a2 over 2. Wow, I really put them out, don't I? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's not down for the count, okay. <laughs> All right, so here, going back over here, A1 or A2, A1 plus A2 over 2 puts you right here, right? And a way of knowing where you would be, you know, if you had two likelihoods, if you actually had two likelihoods, but they were complicated relative to these, and you had the same kind of a binary problem, and you had equal probability, you just set the functions equal to each other, because the threshold will be at the crossroad, will be at the common point. Um, but you know, it looks, looks right, a1 plus a2 over 2, because these are identical functions. Um, well, that means the threshold is in the middle. Basically what that means is the threshold is in the middle. So we looked at, which seems reasonable, for equally probable S1 and S2. It's not going to be in the middle when they're not, because, you know, if you just go back here, so don't be fooled, okay? This could be one-third divided by two-thirds, which is what? One-third divided by one-half. All right, so you would then have this natural log of one half, which is minus, which is going to be minus, a negative number. So if you wanted to change that, you'd then you would flip the signs around. But be careful, this is just um, equally probable when we see this. Now, what is this saying? Well, many times when we transmit binary signals, we'll transmit an S1 and an S2. And we have lots of ways of doing it. Okay, one way is what we call on-off keying. Right, so here comes a binary one. We'll transmit a little pulse of amplitude A. Here comes a binary zero, we transmit nothing. Right, so we save some transmitter power. I'm not saying it's a great scheme, but it's one of the many schemes. It's called OOK on off team. Now, then what we can say is, uh, I mean, of course, you've got to go through the filter. You have to figure out for this S1 and this S2, what is A1 and A2? Right? These are the voltages in the system at the sampling instant for those pulses. Okay, so once we've done that, let's just say, for example, it's A and zero. Then, <laughs> then the threshold, where is it? A over 2, right? A plus 0 over 2. It's in the middle, which makes a lot of sense. You know, when a binary 1 is transmitted, voltage goes out, um, positive voltage goes out, and you expect the voltage at the sampling instant to be higher than some amount, you know, up. And when you don't transmit anything, right, when you don't transmit anything at all, you expect the voltage to be lower. 
So by putting the threshold in the middle of these two alternatives, it seems reasonable. Now you can use what really is actually the optimum scheme. It's the optimum scheme where you take a little square pulse and you let, let it be, say, at amplitude. You can, even, uh, you can even keep, you know, it's not that you have to transmit more power, more average power over many ones and zeros. You can take for binary one a little square pulse of height A over two. And for binary zero, a little square pulse of height minus A over two, 180 degrees out of phase. This is called antipodal signaling. This is optimal. So now, let's say that you know these things come through. So we've got two voltages, A over two and minus A over two. So you've got A over two plus minus A over two over two zero. So now you've transmitted with a positive voltage and a or a positive and a negative voltage, and your threshold is right at zero, right? So you expect the positive voltage to give you a higher than zero, and the negative voltage to drop you below zero. Now, of course, noise changes that. You know, noise is going to cause errors. But, you know, in the presence of noise that's mean of zero, expected value of zero, this is the best thing to do. Now, if the noise mean changes, the story changes. Because, you know, the likelihood the likelihoods here will change. Okay, and the reason for that is because this model changed up here. Okay, so don't forget the assumptions. As engineers, it's always important. We assume, we do a lot of assuming actually. We assume Gaussian noise, we assume the mean of zero, we assume the variance of a certain amount. In fact, we assume we know it. Variance is like the average power of the noise. We assume we know it. So this is a well behaved link. I mean, if I were a communications engine, you know, if I were looking at this critically, frankly, from the industry point of view, I would say, well, that's got to be like a satellite link, or that's got to be a, a link that doesn't have multi It's not a cellular link. You know, it's a wireless link, maybe, in a very nice, uncluttered environment, maybe like a satellite link, or maybe like a microwave link when it isn't raining, or, <laughs> you know, something like this, you know. It's a, it's a well-behaved link. So we made our, we made our assumptions. Don't, please don't forget them. And on top of those, we then assume ones and zeros are equally likely. Sometimes that's the best thing to do, though, because we don't always know the information to the detail where we can say they're not equally likely. This is like a uniform distribution. You know, it's the best thing to do when you don't know any, anything better to do. All right, so we're left with this. And when we simplify, we're left with this, after all those assumptions. So a detector that minimizes the error probability uh, for the case where the signal classes are equally likely. By the way, I didn't show it minimizes anything. All right, I'm assuming for a moment that this is actually minimizes the error probability because to do it, to really show that it does, I have to go here. We make our assumptions, we set up our problem. Here is the density of the two alternatives. We identify the errors, okay? And we, here they are, under the tails. This one is the integral of this curve here from zero, oh no, from the threshold, call it gamma zero, to minus infinity. Okay, and I'm now gonna do it for, I'm not gonna talk now as if P of S1 equals P of S2, equally likely. Plus, uh, this curve, the functional form of this curve, this one here, integrated from gamma zero up to plus infinity. That's my probability of error. And I parameterized it by threshold, gamma zero. Now I'm gonna do what we always have learned to do. Through our many years at USF. <laughs> okay, I'm going to differentiate this thing with respect to gamma zero. Set the result equal to zero. Hope that the objective, you know, the performance function is either concave one way or the other <laughs> and find the minimum point. I'm going to find the best threshold that minimizes the probability of error. 
if I do that, right? Yeah, kind of obvious, but you know, if you really want, if you really want to work it out, that's the rigorous way to do it. <laughs> you know, so that will give you that will give you exactly exactly something like this, where this is gamma zero. You know, this is your threshold. You compare z to this, and you will have minimized the area under those tails. And the setting the threshold there will have minimized the sum of those areas and therefore the probability of error. Okay. So, here is um, the detector looked at from that point of view, right? Because it's not always, you know, so obvious to everybody. The, there are two cases. Probability of error, making a bit error, making a bit error, given that we transmit S1. If the probability of saying H2 is correct, given S1, we really should have said H1, right? But we said H2 is correct, given S1, all right? Which really means the noise threw us on the other side of threshold. That is this integral. This is from the threshold down to minus infinity, okay, of the likelihood. This is just exactly what I was doing before. The other case is making an error given S2 is transmitted. It's the probability of saying H1, right, when S1 was transmitted. So well, this is, um, by the way, this should be S2 over here. Let's see, you may want to please check that because that will be confusing later when you look at it. Uh, probability of saying, it's like H1, which really means probability of saying S1 is true when S2 was transmitted. Probability of saying S2 is true when S1 was transmitted. So those are those two integrals under the tail. Um, threshold up to plus infinity. The bit error rate, now really, don't, don't forget, it's all equally probable. You know, we should be multiplying these errors by the probability of S1 and the probability of S2. You know, but because they're both a half, we don't worry about it. So we just, the bit error rate is, is this. It's the joint error, which may be better seen this way. It's, it's this one times P of S1, this one, the plus, this one times P of S2. Now if S1, P of S1 and P of S2 are equal, you can put a half up in front. And you're just gonna sum this and this. So that's the area under one tail, that's the area under the other tail, times a half, and add it together, it gives you the bit error rate. It gives you what communications engineers quote when they quote the performance of digital communication systems. Okay, bit error rate. So, bit error rate, a half of this, a half of that, um, equals this, equals that. Now, how did you get that? The area under those two tails is identical, right? The densities are Gaussian. They cross at the threshold. The threshold is right, sits right in the middle. And when I integrate under this one, I get the same amount as that one. Okay, so, you know, it's either, it's up to you. You can either pick this, you know, and it's a half of each. So, after, you know, and this equals that. So you can either pick this one or you can either pick this one. You can either integrate this or integrate that. And you have your bit error rate. In the case, they're equally probable. Okay, so we can write, you know, this is the threshold, right? A1 plus A2 over 2. Um, well, I guess we picked, we picked this one. So we've got from gamma zero up to plus infinity, and gamma zero equals this. And then we've got, now here is where I want you, well, we'll get to it, let me, let me get to it. I'm evaluating the bit error rate now for the best threshold. Um, I've got this. What I did was I plugged in the function. I didn't do any more than that. And then you'll notice I have made a change of variables. 
Okay, because what's inside now being integrated? Remember at the very beginning, I think, of this topic, I talked about, um, no, maybe it wasn't. It was at the end of random variables. I talked about the Q function, right? And we were evaluating an interval, the probability of an interval. And I said, well, the random, it was Gaussian. The random variable, I wish I had it to pull it up, but I said the random variable doesn't have a mean of zero or a variance of one. And we need to put it in that form because we can't integrate this thing. Because we cannot integrate either one of these in closed form. You can't integrate a Gaussian density in closed form. So what nice folks have done, Markham was his name, uh, what he did was he actually numerically evaluated all these things and tabulated them. And they're called Markham's Q function. We sometimes just call it Q function. Um, so we have to appeal to a table. And in order to use that table, we need to put whatever we have in the form of an integral of a Gaussian density with a mean of zero and a variance of one. So I need to take this. This has a mean of A2 and a variance of sigma zero squared. I need to take this function and change variables. So I get it in this form. All right, this is a Gaussian density, but it's mean zero. We don't see anything going on up here. And its variance is one. Nothing here, nothing out here. All right, and when I do that, it doesn't change the upper limit. Okay, but it does change the lower limit. And what is the change of variables? You may want to write it down. It's u, u, the new variable, right? This is du. u equals z minus a2 over sigma 0. It's exactly what's inside here. And when you make that change of variable, uh, this will change. Okay, and, and uh, this becomes just an integration on u, or a density with a mean of zero and a variance of one. So let's, if I could just write maybe, how do we get this? How does, what's the reasoning behind this? Let me see if I can use this now. This should be interesting. Um, u sub zero? No. U equals um, quantity, A1 plus A2, divided by two times gamma zero. There. That's very small. Okay, let's see here now. Here we go, black. Is that going to work? Ooh. <laughs> okay, that was the change of variables. Or if you're in Canada, <laughs> as an American living in Canada, when we first went up there, we went looking at the uh, the Nissans. Like in those in those days, they were called Datsuns. I think we looked at this Nissan. I think it was a, a 280ZX, is what I called it. And the guy says, well, we have the ZX outside. I said, yes, is that okay? okay. I, I really wanted to look at this one. He said, that's the one, that's the one. You know, they, every, all Zs over there are Zs. Anyway, here we go. So that's a Z. Um, I think it's to help, maybe, because, you know, sevens can look like a lot of stuff. If you're not very, seven can look really weird. But if you do that, it's a seven. And it doesn't get, now over here, if you do it over here, I'm not sure what it looks like now. But I think maybe part of this is, part of it comes from the French probably, but part of it, part of it comes uh, maybe as a way of certain numbers making them a little bit more clear than they might be for all kinds of handwriting. But anyway, let's assume that Z, so we assume that Z is Gaussian. You know, I'm looking really now back at, like, what are the random variables that created these densities? Um, mean of zero, 
excuse me, Gaussian is not the, it's not Gaussian mean of zero. Can I, <laughs> how do we get rid of this? I think we get rid of this. Yeah, good. Gaussian mean of, uh, Z is Gaussian. Let me just see. Yeah, in this formula, you know, when you look at this, this is the this over here. Okay, what happened? I suppose I think it be. Oh, good. When you look at this density, it's the Gaussian. Okay, I'm not sure I want to say this, but we want to go from Gaussian density with a mean of A2 and a variance of sigma zero squared. We want to go from that to Gaussian with a mean of zero and a variance of one. That's what we want to do because this is the process of standardization. Um, and this is the change of variables up here. Maybe I can get rid of this other stuff. The change of variables that accomplishes that is this one. And let's look at, let's look at the expected, you see, um, yeah, let's look at the expected value of u, just to see if this change of variables works. Now don't forget, one over sigma zero, one over sigma zero is a constant. So I really just need to look at the expected value of z minus a2. Okay, but z has a mean, you know, this quantity here, this density here, has a mean of a2 and a variance of sigma zero squared. So the expected value of z minus a2 is the expected value of z minus the expected value of a2, which is a2. But the expected value of z is a2. So this is zero. Right, because, right, because if you look in this, the form of the density, looking here, the mean value is A2. The variable is Z. So I get zero. So this gives me, uh, U has a mean of zero. So that's part of what, what I wanted to do. Right, that's this part. Variance of one, I'm going to make it very simple. Uh, I'm going to erase this, and we'll do the variance. I'm not going to do it by all the um, sigma zero. I'm not going to do it in the uh, in the way we normally would. But variance of u, remembering that this is a definition, and I'm using symbolics for it. It's always a squared quantity, so I'm going to take one over sigma zero squared. Right? If we square and take the expected value of z minus a2 squared. But this is just sigma zero squared, right? Because we said that, that's right here. Variance of sigma zero squared, right? So sigma zero squared over sigma zero squared, one. So. Does everybody have what they want from this? Okay, so um, I'm going to get rid of. Maybe I don't have to get rid of. I can. I can kind of leave. No, let me get rid of this. So this is. Oops, this is the change of variable that takes you from here to here. And that's the same change of variable that will uh, that will create the new lower limit when you substitute. Uh, in other words, the, the previous lower limit was was in terms of z. Now you find the lower limit in terms of u. Okay, so and once we've done that, the q function is really just 
the lower limit. You know, in other words, when they tabulate, they give you the integral from some lower limit, which you specify in the Q function argument, up to um, infinity. Right, so that's that's basically it. This is a mistake, huh? It's a good thing that you, yeah, this is a mistake. It's a good thing that you mentioned it. This should, <laughs> okay. This lower limit, maybe I tried to write it. This lower limit here should really be uh, A1 minus A2 over 2 threshold. Minus. Yeah, it says plus. It's A1 plus A2. With this thing, you can really mess things up, right? Nobody can see anything, including me. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I had the A1 plus A2 over 2 sigma naught. So it's really A1 minus A2 over 2 sigma naught. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So this is, this is, uh, and sigma naught is A1 plus A2 over 2 for this problem. Okay, so we put it in the form of a Q function. Now I think the idea is to, let's take a look and see, maybe I can get out of this thing now. Take a look and see. Mm. There. That's the complementary error function. Take a look and learn a little bit about what's tabulated. Because in the end, we have to really what we do is we formulate the problem, we compute the expression for the probability of error, we can't integrate it, but we manipulate it in a form in which it's related to, in which we can specify the argument of the Q function. So Q of X, remember I said, you know, this thing here is really just the lower limit. It's the lower limit of an integral of a Gaussian density with a mean of zero and a variance of one. So you have to put your problem in this form. Find out your lower limit, and once you have it, you can use the lower limit to look things up. Like we did with Bessel functions, basically. There we had beta, and beta gave us, a, and then we found out like the number of significant harmonics, or the levels, and we could pick the number of harmonics we wanted. There's another thing around that your book uses, which is called the complementary error function, or Earth C. Right? With the same argument, it's related to the Q function. Some books prefer to use it. An expression that relates Q of X directly to it is this. Right? Some, in other words, some books will tabulate Earth C rather than Q. If they do, then uh, the relationship to Q is this. I'll give you Q, you know, I'll, you'll work with Q. You don't have to, to worry about, there are different ways. Uh, if X, that's the argument, is bigger than about three, then Q of X actually takes an exponential form. It's not quite the Gaussian form because there's a little X here. But it takes this uh, special form when the argument is sufficiently large. So that we don't actually have to go to the table. We can actually just compute this, calculate this for a value of x. Makes things a little easy, but it's an approximation. Okay, let's take an example of all of this. We have a binary digital communication system. Um, I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to say that, you know, we'll choose an S1, we'll choose an S2, and these are probably antipodal, 180 degrees out of phase. And I'm going to tell you that when I take a sample, um, the A sub I is either plus one or minus one volt, and equal probability. So P of S1 equals P of S2, both equal a half. Um, if the Gaussian noise has unit variance, find the probability of a bit error. Now, Gaussian noise always has a, Z, a mean of zero, and now I'm saying that the variance is one. Variance related to the average power of the noise. Hmm? Unit variance. Unit. Variance of unity. Or unit variance. Find the probability of a bit error. 
Okay, look, probability of a bid error. That's the expression we have. This is the value of x. Right? We just found that expression. Uh, we can't actually calculate it. We'll have to find, you know, a little bit to find this given what the problem. So anyway, it's one minus a minus one. Two times one. So two times one over two, q of one. We go to the table, 16%. That's high. Probably that's one in, well, 16%. What is that? One every six bits. Very high. So not a very good system. But we've seen worse in this class, actually. <laughs> so that's, this is not too bad. Okay, probability of a bit error is 16%. Uh, and why is the reason for this? Somebody tell me, why is this so high? Perfect. You've got two Gaussian densities centered at minus one and plus one, and the standard deviation, and they're wide, right? A standard deviation is one, right? So a variance is one, too. You know, so these things are like well overlapped, and the area under the tails is pretty large. Okay? It's like about 16%, so they're pretty big. So it's um, not a great system. You're not putting enough for the noise variation. You're not putting enough power into the, or enough voltage power into the signals. You're not separating them well enough. Okay, now a concept which is critical. In all of this, there are two concepts that are important. One is the idea of detection using the a posteriori probabilities to form a likelihood ratio to test against a threshold. That's a key element of everything. Everything. That's really a big statement. But let me take it from one end to the other. Okay? Um, when the NSA looks at our communications, oh, we're not supposed to do that, but when the NSA looks at our communications and they do pattern matching, and they have several systems, uh, with very impressive names for doing this type of thing. They do this. They're looking for the likelihood of specific words, specific structures, specific phrases, specific things. And they're testing a likelihood ratio against the threshold constantly. And when we use the cellular system and experience a pretty good performance that we experience each and every bit, is tested against the threshold at a very high speed in order to establish the recover, the ones and the zeros, after a multipath propagation. So the channel model and the noise models that go into that and the standards are much more complex. It's the same, it's the same process. It's detection theory. The second thing that's really important is that front end filter going way back to the beginning the front end filter, because as was just pointed out, we have a case where we got plus or minus one volt, we put that into the signals, but we've got a lot of noise, or the noise variation is wide. Could we do better in the front end so that we get less than 16%? And the answer is yes. We can match the characteristics of the front end filter to the characteristics of the transmitted signals. And by doing that, we increase the so-called signal-to-noise ratio, which improves the performance. That's what the idea of a matched filter is. It's a filter matched to the characteristics of the transmitted signals. So in the simplest case, if I transmit a little, I mean, if I could, you know, you realize now it takes a lot of frequency to transmit a square pole. But if I transmit a square pulse, that's maybe not a good example. Say I transmit like a cosine shaped pulse, which are used in communication systems, a rounded square pulse, then, and say I transmit for a binary zero, I transmit like a negative rounded pulse. 
for a binary one, I transmit a positive rounded pulse. My front end filter should have an impulse response that's identical to the shape of that pulse. Doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, to the shape of the pulse. And by matching the front end filter to the pulse transmission shape, we get much better performance. Much, much better. Okay, so the concept of a the second important concept, a matched filter. So a linear filter to provide maximum signal to noise power ratio. This is a matched filter. And signal to noise power ratio, this is like signal to noise power um, ratio. <laughs> this in this kind of a system is like a sub i squared divided by sigma zero squared. Okay, now what am I saying? You've got a system with two alternatives, A1, A2. Or, excuse me, S1 of T, S2 of T. At the sampling point, I've got a voltage, A1 or A2. If I'd like to know what the average power is at that instant, looks like A1 squared in a one ohm load or A2 squared, right? So this is like average signal power at that instant of time. Now we may want to refine our idea of that, but for the moment it's just the square of the voltage. Okay. So it's really not average. I would call it instantaneous power. Square of the voltage for either alternative A1 or A2. This is the noise power. The variance of the noise is an important concept. The variance of the noise is actually related to the average, this is now average noise power. So it's like instantaneous signal power to average noise power. And later I'm going to come back to this and show you how the variance of the noise, the variance of the Gaussian density is actually related to power. Um, so for the moment, just, you know, the signal to noise ratio, so instantaneous signal power to average noise power. And a linear filter, now I want to be a little bit careful, say that I have a, sig a single signal I transmit, S of T, just one, not two. And I say, what's the matched filter impulse response to that signal? It's something like this. We'll take S of T, we'll time reverse it, We'll delay it by that sampling interval. And maybe there's a constant outside, unimportant really. But this is the impulse response that's matched to S of T. Now, of course, I may have S1 of T and S2 of T. In that previous example I gave you, though, I had S of T and minus S of T. And the plus and minus is really irrelevant for this. The front end filter should be exactly this, S of big T minus little t. It's matched to the shape of the pulse. Well, let the detector decide what the polarity is down, down the way. Um, this is kind of weird. I'm going to leave you with this weird thought. Because we took the signal, we time reversed it, and we delayed it kind of like the first thing that we would do in a convolution, right? One of them. We take one of the signals, we time, re we time reverse it and delay it. So what happens when I stick S of T into this filter? This is a very interesting sort of a thing. S of T comes rolling in. The impulse response looks like this. Okay, so now let me like graphically do the convolution. Well, we can either take the input time reverse it and delay it, or we can take the impulse response, doesn't matter, time reverse it and delay it. So we take this, time reverse and delay, it looks like S of T, right? So I think that's how we got it. We took S of T, we time reversed and delayed it. So now we're going to take what we did and time reverse it and delay it. We'll come back to what we had in the beginning, S of T. So actually, when S of T comes in, it gets multiplied by S of T, right? It's sliding across S of T. 
in, in integrating like convolution. You know, you integrate and multiply and integrate. All right. So when we say match, we really mean match. We mean that in the act of convolution, the operation really results in s of t times itself, or s of t sliding by itself. So there'll be an instance of time where you get s of t squared. <laughs> in this. All right. So we haven't. In the end, though, it's just an impulse response. You know. So and it's an impulse response that's very specially selected to be directly related to the transmitted signal shape. Uh, this is the process of convolution. I'm going to end with this slide. Uh, you know, we'll take a received signal and we'll convolve it with an impulse response, a linear system. We can write it this way. Uh, we'll assume, um, what do we call it? Uh, we'll assume the signals aren't the signal is zero for negative time. Uh, we'll stick in, you know, we'll stick this in for this particular filter. We'll let k equal one for convenience. We'll rewrite it this way, and we'll simplify it this way <laughs> at the sampling instant. When little t equals big T, which is a time we sample, what we get is what we call a correlation. We get the received signal with the transmitted signal, S of t. Right? In other words, we get the received signal with S of t from the linear filter integrated over a period 0 to t. That's at the sampling instant. So now up in front, we've got a linear filter whose impulse response is matched to the transmitted signal. I mean, a lot of the details I have, you the idea. Matched to the transmitted signal, in this sense, we fixed up the impulse response. Now, here comes the um, received signal. Now, of course, to receive signal is signal plus noise. And that's this, but I haven't really, you know, we can write this now as S of tau plus N of tau. And we will eventually, but for the moment, let's just be to leave it this way. When that received signal comes in, the convolution with the linear filter can be realized in this fashion. Okay, now what have, what have I done at the instant of time? Now there are two things going on. If the signal comes into a linear filter, I can observe the output of a linear filter from, say, 0 to t. And I'll get, like, a curve. And then I sample at the instant t. But, you know, in a way, all this other stuff was really useless. Because I'm only going to sample at one instant of time, every t seconds. Or I can realize it as a correlation, a mixer, just like we did many times in the first half of the course. Here comes the receive signal. Here is my reference. S, and I multiply them together and integrate for a period of t seconds. That gives me exactly the sample value that the linear filter gave me at that same time. But I don't have to look at all the other stuff. The two ways to implement the front end as a linear filter or convolution or as a correlator. In the cell phones that we have, it's all correlation. Right? Because what they basically do is they do a very rapid, fast correlation and just give you the sample instant. You know, try to recreate the entire thing from zero to t. Sample instant, decision. Sample instant, decision. So this is important. I will come back to this next time and, and the concept of a max filter. Um, and what we need to do now, though, just like a little next week, we need to put in here signal and look at what comes out at that time instant, because that's the component of the signal at the sampling instant. And then noise, and see what comes out at the sampling instant. That's going to be the noise that's going to affect us at that sampling instant. So now we're really looking into some details. You know, how do these receivers really work? You know, what's up in the front, and how does that affect our decision? It's good stuff. 
I mean, at any digital communication system, we're taking like a binary case, maybe equally probable, Gaussian noise, okay, but all the fundamentals don't change. When someone comes along and says, well, you've got 390 alternatives, it's a, a, it's a phase shift keying system, and we're going to have a, a whole bunch of front end correlates. It's very troublesome. It gets more complicated, though, in the implementation, surely. But the fundamental theory uh, is simpler. I will say one thing, though. Finding the optimum threshold is only possible in the binary case. We can find good thresholds as the symbols get more complicated, the alphabet grows. We can find very nice thresholds, um, but they're not optimal in the same sense. The same thing goes for pattern recognition. We have two classes of data, right? And we can, you know, they form like clusters, and the clusters overlap. And we usually put like what we call a hyperplane for decision making. That's the threshold. And some of the things are on the wrong side. Some of the points are on the wrong side. That's the error in determining whether what the class is. Is it class one or class two? A feature, well, class one or class two, category one or category two. But in that case, we can find an optimal hyperplane. As soon as we go to more than two classes and more clusters, we can use a lot of uh, performance measures to find good separation and decision. But they aren't as optimal. So there's a lot more that really, that really could be done when it comes to higher dimensionality problems. You know, the real digital communication systems really use methods that are reasonable and derive from these optimal methods. And they work well. They still work well. Okay, I'll be coming up with, I guess, the last homework, maybe. Probably, I don't know if I'll do it this weekend, but within the next week or so. The last homework. Um, your project, don't forget. You know, you've, I've got a lot of them, and a lot of them are very interesting this year. So keep that up, and, and if you haven't put one in, do. And I'll see you next week. Okay, have a good weekend.